I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Join me on a quest to find awe and wonder in all creation, human or wild, vast or small, encounters that move us beyond words. I'm very eager to share this episode with you. Wonder weaves through and through it in unexpected and subtle ways with the supposed death mask of a famous 19th century composer who probably wasn't anywhere near dead yet, just holding very still for his portrait in plaster, a teenager's escape during World War II through the brick wall of the Warsaw Ghetto, an attempt with AI to resurrect an honored ancestor. And not to omit in any of this, thoughts from our guest about what stars in the night sky might have to say. In two published volumes, the cartoonist Amy Kurzweil has put to paper scenes from her family's story, details of which have been slippery and at times very disorienting for her. So even with whatever hard facts she's been able to eke out of the riddlesome past, still at times it's been necessary for her just to imagine, remaining as true as she possibly can to whatever really happened, given all the missing puzzle pieces. You see, Amy has an unusual family story that has been shattered and shaped by the Holocaust. That alone would be daunting enough. How has she folded this unspeakable poignant legacy with all the other strands of her family's history into her ongoing quest for meaningful connection, a sense of her own identity today as part of a family? Because she is a cartoonist, it shouldn't surprise any of us that she viewed this big task as an artistic one. We're going to hear how her artist's eye and creative approach have been vital to her aims. I hope you'll come away feeling, as do I, that whatever pieces of a family puzzle go missing, we can still find consolation and inspiration in the pieces that aren't lost. And then, as we inevitably wonder about the holes and the gaps— the stuff we can never really know. With that creative spirit, we might still imagine and produce a credible picture of things, a picture that has integrity. Amy Kurzweil spent her entire childhood in the same house, built in 1899 outside of Boston, one particular room was especially important to her family. This room had two pianos that were facing each other. And one of the pianos was my grandfather's Baldwin piano, my grandfather Fred, who was a classical pianist. My father inherited that piano. And then the other one was a Kurzweil synthesizer. My father is an inventor. One of his inventions is this synthesizer piano that plays the sounds of a full orchestra, you know, with just a piano. And the synthesizer was embedded in a kind of piano frame. It was like an artificial piano in the frame of a real piano. So they both just looked like these classical pianos facing each other. And the Baldwin was old and a bit out of tune, and I never played that one. But I did play the Kurzweil synthesizer. Amy never progressed very far with her keyboard studies. She had only a year or two of piano lessons. It's not that she didn't like music. On the contrary, she loved dancing to it, but not making it. Apart from just those two prized musical instruments, that room held more inspiration for her later artistic life. It was brimming with books and various odd artifacts and heirlooms that seized her attention. I would go into this room supposedly to practice the piano, but I I think I spent more time sort of looking around at the objects in the room and and interested in the library, interested in the the strange puppets on display. We had these puppets of old old people, I guess. They were just old kind of grandma and grandpa puppets uh, seated on top of the photo album. And then there was this this mask um, on the wall. I was told later by my father that this is Beethoven's death mask. It's probably made from a plaster mold or or something. It's like white and framed, and it just looks like the mask of a sleeping man, basically. Uh, But when I was a kid, I thought that this was the mask of my grandfather, my grandfather's death mask. Uh, Because my grandfather, this classical pianist from, from Vienna, 
looked a lot like Beethoven. So I'm told. I grew up thinking that it was my grandfather, Fred, (laughs) on the wall, watching me not play the piano. (laughs) (laughs) Amy Kurzweil is a visual artist by profession. I've told you that she loves music and loves to dance, but she's made her real mark as a cartoonist. Her work appears regularly in The New Yorker, and she's writer and artist of two graphic memoirs that tell the story of her quest. The first is titled Flying Couch, focusing on her mother's side of the family, and the second turns to her father's side. It's titled Artificial, A Love Story. These two books depict the gradual unfolding and deepening of her love and wonder and admiration for people in her family's past in spite of elusive and even vanished details. She has felt over many years a magnetic sort of tug to unlock past events. Along the way, she's found herself wondering things like, can I draw what has happened to my family, including those presences who are fading into the past and and keep things authentic, real, honest? Would it be too artificial? Amy's medium seems straightforward. You use pen and paper to make pictures. But before you can draw pictures of people from your past, before you can imagine them, you have to do the important work of gathering up everything you can possibly learn or ever really know about them. And where do you start? Is it possible that the very first tangible objects in your life that represent your grandfather were that mask and that piano, perhaps even the old man puppet sitting with the grandma puppet on the, on the photo album? Absolutely. Yeah, so this is my, my father's father. And he's a real source of interest and inspiration for me, probably because of interacting with these objects of his life and having a story about him that was really kind of mythical and incomplete and had the, the arc of a kind of fairy tale. He lived in Vienna, kind of outside the main ring. And he was this really gifted pianist and conductor, renowned as a a young adult. Uh, He was in his 20s. He was, in 1937, conducting a choral concert in a, a big, beautiful, grand Viennese music hall. And a woman from America was in the audience. And she heard him conduct this concert. And she was so impressed with his artistry and his talent that, you know, she went up to him afterwards and she said, I I love your work. Basically, I'm a fan. If you ever need anything, let me know. And that was 1937. And the next year, uh, the Nazis marched into Vienna. My grandfather, who's Jewish, uh, he was was Jewish in identity, but not a particularly observant Jew, but he was Jewish in his blood. And so he needed a way out of Vienna. So he wrote to this woman and she agreed to sponsor him to America. So the story I grew up with is that my grandfather... He saved his own life with his musical talent. He was fortunate to to find this woman. And I I later learned sort of how amazing that story was and how difficult it was to get a sponsor and how remarkable, really, it was and how fortunate he was. So really what I had was, you know, the piano, the death mask, and the stories. Amy never met her larger-than-life immigrant grandfather in person, the maestro Fred Kurzweil, whom we've been hearing in an old recording playing a rhapsody by Brahms. He died in 1970. Hold on to these few details that we've just heard about Fred Kurzweil and his immigrant story. Fred is a hugely important figure in Amy's journey of discovery, and we're going to get back to him including a very interesting chapter about a project that was devised to bring Fred's words back to life using AI. But I want you to hear right now Amy bringing in a companion story. It's the improbable story from her first book of what happened to her maternal grandmother, Lillian Fenster, a remarkable figure and a very real presence in Amy's life, given that Lillian Fenster is still alive. Bubby, as she's called in Yiddish, escaped from the Warsaw Ghetto in 1941 at age 15. When I spoke with Amy, her grandma, her Bubby, was 97. She's a really exuberant, wonderful, joyful person, not without her complications, but she survived without any artifacts, without a photograph of her family members. 
unlike Fred Kurzweil, whose extensive legacy of personal documents is going to be crucial later in this episode. But Bubby came to America with nothing of the kind. Amy once heard Bubby express how much she wishes she could draw, if only to capture or produce some record of what her mother's face looked like. The only surviving likeness exists in Bubby's memory alone. Amy, the artist, illustrator, cartoonist, latched on to what she was hearing. That was a big motivation for me in terms of the role of drawing, is how can I use drawing to create artifacts that aren't there? You know, how can I document people in my own way through imagination? I don't know what her family members look like. My grandmother was born in 1926 in Warsaw, Poland, to a big family. She had four sisters, she had parents and a grandmother, and they all lived together. She shared a bed with her grandmother. She really loved her grandmother and had a really close relationship. And they were not wealthy, but they were okay. The Nazi siege on Warsaw began in 1939. In the chaos of war, Bubby's world would be obliterated. Amy has pieced together details, listening directly to Bubby herself, also from the known history of World War II in Poland, and from oral history recordings made with Bubby in more recent years by a researcher outside the family. Bubby was probably 13 when the raids began. Shrapnel struck her hip, leaving her with a lifelong limp. She came home from the hospital to learn that her own Bubby had died. Over many months, the noose around the Warsaw ghetto tightened. Starvation was a big issue, and that was sort of the the main impetus for her father telling her that she needed to leave the ghetto. Her sisters had um, started to die from starvation. She has a really vivid memory of one of her younger sisters asking her for bread and then, you know, passing away. And so her father said to her eventually, you know, you're, you're the oldest. You speak Polish, you know, because in the family they spoke Yiddish. Um, you're smart. And also, crucially, she had blonde hair and blue eyes. So he said, I think not only can you escape, but I think you can pass. And so he identified this hole in the wall around the ghetto. And there were a few bricks missing in the wall. And my grandmother snuck out through those bricks. On the other side of the wall was a, a cemetery, and she spent the night in that cemetery. And then from there, she set out on her journey to basically visit different farms in the Polish countryside. Passing as a Catholic orphan, young Lillian moved from farm to farm working as a day laborer for food and shelter. People who may or may not have known what she really was, I think maybe some of them knew and some of them didn't know, these people took her in. And that was how she survived. Um, I believe she went back to the ghetto at least once, maybe a few times, to bring her family food, snuck back through the the hole in the wall and then out again. But, you know, eventually she had to completely leave that part of Poland and she walked across Poland. And um, at the end of the war, she was, uh, you know, a 19-year-old adult. And uh, she met my grandfather, who was also a survivor, And that was basically the start of her her new life. I hope you did the math with me just now. It was probably a full four years of surviving all alone, an orphan, as a Jewish teenager in Poland while the war raged. And now imagine Amy trying over many years to digest and come to terms with Bubby's story, little by little pulling details into focus. Yes, she's close to this grandmother. You might think Bubby would be a ready source of detail, never really out of reach for questions. But these are Bubby's memories of the loss of her entire family, of extreme physical suffering as a fugitive amid war's terror. These are memories that are difficult and sometimes impossible to relive. For her graphic memoir, Flying Couch, for instance, Amy drew a scene in which Bubby sees with her own eyes the horror of a bombing raid, the scene of younger sister Masha's death by starvation, and more. 
These various scenes came together for Amy's storyboard, not ready-made, not in any organized fashion, but as painstakingly retrieved puzzle pieces. My encounter with her history was piecemeal growing up. Suddenly, she would launch into an episode. For example, she would often talk about her sister. She told me I looked like her sister, that we had the same eyes or something like that. She would often be sort of prompted to a particular memory. And growing up, that was very disorienting to suddenly be thrust, you know, without a lot of other context, without knowing the, the whole story, to suddenly be thrust into that that sort of history. So I, I, that was probably the most impactful thing that really led me to want to tell stories about my grandparents is this sort of disorienting, suddenly you're on the floor in the Warsaw Ghetto with, you know, dying children and like, How did we get there and how did you get here? And wanting to really understand all of that. I've been moved not just by Amy's personal and family story in her graphic memoir, Flying Couch, which includes heart-rending scenes from young Lillian's sojourn of survival in Poland with all the trauma, told or untold, but also just thinking about the delicate task Amy faced of trying to imbue her illustrations with emotional integrity, with as much honesty and accuracy as can be inked to paper. After all, when it comes to Bubby's side of the family, we're talking about faces and events that have vanished with no trace, no documentation, no photos, no certificates, no passports, diaries, letters, and certainly no famous death masks. Just bits and snatches as Bubby has been willing to speak them. I've drawn scenes from from her life, you know, without having a lot of documentation of what these things would have looked like. I had to really imagine and use kind of my emotional sense. Um, And I had to figure out a way to draw her family members without knowing what they looked like, which is interesting because... When I'm drawing these things, I want to draw attention to the sort of felt absence of them. I don't want to draw them how they don't look. So in drawing these things, I often would occlude things I didn't know, you know, like put a window frame in front of a face or draw a character in a kind of position such that we don't really see their face, but we see their body and their expression, um, the expression of their body, but we're not seeing their faces. So I did a lot of drawings in that vein in order to convey the sense of what was happening to my grandmother and her family without misrepresenting some specific detail because I'm aware that I don't have access to those things. Amy Kurzweil is our guest here on Constant Wonder. She's a cartoonist for The New Yorker and author-illustrator of the graphic memoirs Flying Couch and Artificial. Amy has described Bubby as being an exuberant 97-year-old today. To me, it seems it would be presumptuous on my part when talking about a Holocaust survivor just to glibly toss out that word resilient. There was just too much pain, too much suffering in Bubby's life, for one thing. And for another, I, I just don't know her personally. But... Resilience does show in survivors, and certainly Amy can vouch for somebody she knows and loves. She doesn't like to put on pretenses, I guess, you know, she's just going to tell it like it is. If she doesn't feel like wearing pants, she's not going to wear pants, you know, that kind of woman. A real source of humor, as well as a source of, you know, access to this real tragic story that I wanted to understand. We'll be right back to this episode of Constant Wonder with cartoonist Amy Kurzweil. Going back now to your father's side and Fred, the the grandfather musician from Vienna, be that little girl again growing up outside of Boston, spending so much time in that piano room with a mask on the wall, uh, that thing, uh, was was that a, a haunting artifact? Well, it is haunting because it's white <laughs> and the eyes are closed. It's very minimal. It's sort of in the corner of that room. So it's really like, it's almost like a moon hanging, you know, in the corner. This like big white orb that sort of glows on the rest of the room. So it was kind of a friendly haunting, I guess. It it definitely had a quality of like another another world. When you're a little girl and you see that mask hanging on the wall, were you saying to yourself, well, there's grandpa's image? 
Yeah, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> but, you know, something that's interesting about Fred is that he was just such a distant figure to me. So it was almost like Beethoven and Fred, my grandfather, were similar in my mind because they were both these really distant, talented artist figures who had these epic stories about their lives. And and I think I was really curious about my grandfather because, well, what does it mean that I'm related to this person, but I have such a distant understanding of him? I have such a mythical understanding of him. So, you know, ultimately, I was really interested in closing that gap and trying to find a way to connect to him that was less mythical and more personal. So there are no professional artists in your immediate family, but he was an artist, you're an artist. I'm just wondering if in your contemplation of who he was and what he stands for and what he valued, were you thinking of him just as grandpa? Or how important was the artistic component in in your speculations? Yeah. I would say that was primary. I didn't have necessarily professional artists in my family that I could look to as people who'd really made a career immersing themselves in not just the professional aspect of of art, but like the creative spirit of art. And it seemed like he represented to me based on everything I heard about him and maybe to a fault, to be honest, but he represented to me this person who their main motivation was communing with the creative spirit. And the other stories I heard about him, besides the epic surviving story, the other stories I heard about him all had to do with just how transcendent, that's usually the word that was used, how transcendent his artistry was. And particularly when he was conducting, that he would be sort of possessed by this creative spirit, consumed by the the force of artistry. And people just wanted to be around that. And that was really the main way that his identity was communicated to me, not as like a father or a grandfather, but as an artist. And I, I think that's really inspiring. I mean, I think it's also complicated. It's, it's inspiring and it's something, but you know, maybe there's also something sort of missing there. Sort of missing things are the very things that Amy has hoped to memorialize in these graphic memoirs piecing things back together to understand them better, to understand herself better. But apart from capturing her family story on both sides, she also wanted to gain a better sense of her broader Jewish, cultural, political, and religious heritage. It was in some measure this latter desire that took her to the opposite side of the world as a young adult. Age 20, she found herself in Israel, her first time outside the United States. The experience was sponsored by the Birthright Israel Foundation. That's an organization that wants to bolster a sense of Jewish identity for young adults of the Jewish diaspora who are found most anywhere in the world, people like Amy. My experience in Israel was really confusing because on the one hand, it was an experience of sort of intense Jewish community that I hadn't hadn't had a lot of which I both wanted and was suspicious of. We all want real community and connection with people who are like us and who have similar histories as us and similar ways of thinking and similar values. But then, you know, as an American, you really value diversity. I think I felt a real tension on that trip. They took us to the, the Dead Sea, which is really a really intense experience because it's, it's so salty and so full of sulfur that your skin burns and you float and you spread mud all over your body. We climbed Mount Masada at 5 a.m., you know, woke up, spent a night in the desert with Bedouins in Israel and rode camels. And um, one of the more memorable experiences is uh, we were taken to the desert at night and told to be completely alone. It was very dark and you'd walk away from everyone else so you couldn't see anyone else. You had your own space and just look up at the sky. And that, that was a pretty intense experience of, you know, sort of seeing 360 degrees of stars. So, Amy, there you are, out in the desert in Israel, alone at night. You're young. You're in this program that gives you an opportunity to think about your Jewish heritage in the, in, in the big picture. 
but it is a program that's probably also promoting the modern day state of Israel. And, and for you, for your family, immediate family, these things are, are more of a backstory. And you're feeling, this comes through quite obviously in, in Flying Couch, you are feeling conflicted, uh, maybe even a little artificial, you know, about even being there because you really only have a nominal connection to the place. My personal family history was not connected to Israel. It was connected to Europe and then America. And so I came back from that trip unclear sort of what my role should be as an American Jew from a, a different part of the world. Did those stars help you out, uh, trying as you were, a 20-year-old, to uh, situate yourself in the world, taking your bearings on everything? Were the stars good for you? Did they help you? That's a great question. I mean, the stars were an experience of a kind of cosmic, if there's anything in the world that can make you feel a sort of sense of the spiritual wonder of the universe, it is that, it is that kind of vision. I do remember that pretty vividly. That experience of the sort of cosmic wonder was not limited to one particular place. And my sense of, of being who I was, being Jewish, being a person, this sort of history of Jewish people wandering, being exiled from homes, you know, not always knowing where they belong. I think that's a pretty profound feature of my particular Jewishness is that like it is, I am a wandering Jew. If you are a wanderer, the stars can be one thing that's constant, not just a constant feature, doesn't matter where you are on the globe, they're there, but a source of constant wonder. Earlier, you used the words cosmic wonder and that kind of gives me a little bit of permission here i want to i want to stick with what whatever transcendent feeling stars bring for so many people from from my religious training i, I i'm not jewish i grew up reading the bible the psalms i've always loved a few particular astronomical references found there the psalmist david when I consider thy heavens, the moon and the stars, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Uh, Book of Amos, seek him who made the seven stars and Orion. So he's talking about, you know, these constellations. He's talking about the Pleiades. He's, he's talking about what, the, the stars. The stars are with us. In my first book, the stars are a motif that I used based on the stars or based on the feeling of looking at the stars swirls and squiggles and you know maybe they even look a little bit like when you close your eyes so there, there's this sort of like motif that I was trying to develop it was something that I would replay in the book when I wanted to communicate a sense of connection beyond myself it's a very positive motif as opposed to some of the more negative motifs in my book like for example bricks you know for obvious reasons were a, a negative motif a sense of being closed in and cut off but the star motif was something that would come in when I was having a moment of creative communion, connection, either to my art or to people. And so I, I think that that's not so far off base, what you're suggesting, that the if I'm a wanderer, because you know so much of, of Flying Couch is about my quest for home and the difficulty of finding home and you know really being able to um, feel safe in a particular home for too long. What's stable is the creative act you know, and that, that feeling, whatever that feeling is that I was representing through buoyant stars and squiggles, um, that's, that's the stability and that's sort of what I'm always looking for in life. Fast forward now, it's 2016, a decade after Amy's Israel trip, and the same year that her graphic memoir, Flying Couch, landed, that's the volume in which her bubby, her grandmother, figures so prominently. The life of artists can be very project-based, like musicians, always hoping to line up another gig. You're wrapping one up, you're scrambling for the next. Depending on your success, it might seem a bit of an oxymoron that Amy had found a stable artistic career. But as Amy says, what's stable is the creative act. At any rate, in 2016, Amy's father launched himself into a new project of his own, and Amy would soon be collaborating with him. Uh, 
The project focused on Grandpa Fred Kurzweil, the Viennese maestro, who had owned that Baldwin piano and the Beethoven death mask handed down in the family and hanging on the wall. Oh, now, here's a fascinating footnote for you. The Beethoven mask, Amy thought was Fred's face, actually looks full and healthy, not emaciated. Probably not made the week of Beethoven's death at all, but probably made much earlier in his life. In other words, a life mask. Teasing out the truth about this family heirloom, it kind of mirrors so many other riddles and ambiguities of Amy's journey. Fred's son, Amy's father and inventor of that piano synthesizer, is Ray Kurzweil. You possibly know of him already. He's an eminent computer scientist connected with Google, a futurist, transhumanist, a theorist who has expounded on something called the singularity, something supposedly barreling down on all the human race that we haven't got time to address here. Ask a passionate futurist, a philosopher, a sci-fi fan about that. Might want to do it quick. Ray's plan for the immediate future was to develop a tech tool to bring his father back, or kind of back. In an interview with NPR, Ray said of his father, Fred, I missed him, so I created a technology that seemed like talking to him. You could ask him anything and he would actually answer something similar to what I remember he would have said. Now this, Ray's idea was an AI application long before ChatGPT. In order to make his software plan work, it would be necessary to ingest whatever remains of first-person written material from Fred. This wouldn't be the first artist-scientist collaboration in world history, but Amy was well-suited for working with Ray on this project simply because of her compelling interest in pulling together tantalizing pieces in her puzzle. In the end, her role left her swimming neck deep in a vast sea of documents that Fred had left behind. So with my father, you know, I remember reading in his books this particular plan he had. And then I also remember seeing in a documentary that was made about my father, which is called Transcendent Man, an articulation of this particular plan he had for his father's documents. And then it was really like, oh, wow, my father is actually doing this. Like, what does that mean? That my father was planning to use his father's documents to, in a sense, resurrect his father, creating a chatbot that would use my grandfather's writing and then married with AI, then speak in my grandfather's voice or at least write in my grandfather's voice. As magical or impossible or almost religious as that may sound, Once the gears started turning, Amy realized that her contribution was actually very down-to-earth, hands-on clerical work, a super practical sort of function. And by the way, Ray's tool came to be known as FredBot, not to be confused with the FredBot on YouTube, who is known for children's jingles and nursery rhymes. He's no relation at all to the Kurzweils. It was like, oh, we're taking the documents from the storage unit, putting them into a computer, and then a program has been created that is a way of accessing different parts of my grandfather's life, offering different snippets of things that he wrote in response to questions. And it's like a really useful tool. And so I wanted to really understand, like, what is this tool? How is it connected to some of the things that I am already engaged in doing with kind of the the quote-unquote resurrection of the past and the preservation of memory How is it similar to that? How is it different? How can I compare this to what I'm already doing as a writer and an artist? Is this a new paradigm for memory? As technology gets more sophisticated, will this have its own agency? That's, you know, that those are the farther future questions. But I I actually wanted to spend more time with the sort of grounded practical, like what is the role of this technology in my life? Forget the old tropes about an artist not being down-to-earth, grounded, practical. She dug in for what must have been endless hours to assist her father in this enterprise, but also just to read with her own eyes original palpable documents. What I did was I spent a lot of time in these storage units uh, that were housing my grandfather's artifacts, and I found my grandfather's writing, you know, waded through all these different things that were saved, found examples of his writing, And then I did a lot of transcribing of those documents. 
the text needed to be digitized uh, in order to be married with an algorithm that could then process that language. At some point, you sat down, or your dad sat down, or both both of you sat down and started asking Fred questions. Yeah, so I had an experience where I sat down and asked questions of the algorithm. When I would ask a question, I would get an answer, and often I was familiar with the answer because I was involved in transcribing those words. I had come across those words before, Sometimes I remembered that I'd come across those words before. Sometimes the words surprised me. I was also not the only one transcribing documents. And so I should clarify that this chatbot, unlike some chatbots that people might be familiar with today, like ChatGPT, this chatbot was not creating new language. So it was not putting words that were brand new in the voice of Fred. It was selecting something from his archive that he'd already said and presenting it to you as an answer to a question. So... Uh, For example, you know, what do you love about music? There'd be some answer about, you know, I love um, the particular answer that I remember is he a passage where he talks about the voice and the the sort of resonance of the human voice and that being an aspect of music that he's most connected to. You see an old answer in response to a new question and it, it helps you think about the original words in a different way or you're making connections to something that he once said, and you're, you're sort of seeing it in a, in a different light. Um, you know, I asked him, what's the meaning of life? <laughs> and like, the answers were amazing. They were really moving. He talked about uh, the experience of conducting a chorus, and which I think was the meaning of his life. That was something that he loved, is conducting people and voices and bringing them together. And he also had a, a line about the, the meaning of what a work of art does is that it starts by opening you to the life of the creator and it ends by exposing you to yourself. Um, There's also a really simple answer that he gave to the meaning, what's the meaning of life, which is love. So there are these both personal truths for Fred and also larger universal truths that this process of asking questions in this way revealed. It was really creative and I came to see the experience as a creative tool, you know, more than a kind of resurrection. The creative process is its own kind of resurrection, you know? So it was, it was sort of like the experience helped me demystify the technology and remystify the experience of just being a human being. It was a a vehicle through which I was having surprising realizations about my grandfather. And this game I was playing with the chatbot did not exist in a vacuum. You know, it existed alongside these other experiences that I was having with his legacy, which are my childhood memories of, you know, his piano and his artifacts. And I experienced asking my father about him, hearing other family members share memories about him. So the the game was in the context of other elements of his legacy. And so that made the game meaningful. Whatever this pseudo-resurrection may ultimately have afforded Amy, in her hunger to get to know her deceased grandfather. It was, of course, just AI, completely dependent upon whatever words she or others fed into the system. What would ultimately prove most momentous for her was just having had a chance to be hands-on with those original documents, items that Fred's own hands had produced or touched. There was nothing artificial to these artifacts, they seemed like a concrete way of getting closer to him. The storage unit did have a haunted quality. You asked about if the mask was haunted, and I would say that this experience in the storage unit was probably the most haunted experience I had. And I would characterize, for me, haunting means there's an emotional tenor in my experience that is making me have a certain kind of sense of mystery, sense of awe, at what is happening and what's explaining what's happening. Uh, So a number of things happened that were very surprising and intense when I went to visit the storage unit. Back near that old Kurzweil home, Amy's father Ray had retained space in this multi-storied facility that we've been talking about for holding his father's things. Amy describes the scene in some detail for us. (laughs) 
it seemed like the place was endless. It had multiple floors, and each floor was a sort of dark maze of these long hallways and, and sliding doors. They slid from the top down. And there was really no one else around. And it was the kind of place where all the lights were off, but when you walked, the lights would turn on. So there were motion sensor lights. But the lights would keep turning off if you didn't move, you know, in the right way. So, you know, I'm navigating this archive. I have two keys in my hand and I don't know which one I want to go to first or what's in each place. So I go to the first, uh, the first unit and open the door, big sliding door. And in the middle of the storage unit is what appears to be an old man. And I screamed. I'm not somebody who's ever hallucinated. I don't believe in ghosts. I, I've never seen a ghost before, but this was so vivid and extreme and I didn't know what to make of it. Then a few seconds later, I remembered what I was looking at, a lifelike wax figurine of uh, a character named George, who my father had purchased um, as like a statue that he kept in his office. And this particular storage unit was full of of office things from my father's uh, office that he'd recently packed up. Um, and it had George sitting in the middle <laughs> of the storage unit. So it, that put me in a mood of, but I was also already in the mood to be scared and to be, you know, sort of believing that what I was seeing was was haunted. The second thing that happened that was strange, I think has, I don't have as much of an explanation for. Uh, I, I went to the other storage unit and opened it and that one was full of boxes and I started looking through them and they had photographs of my grandfather, uh, news clippings, uh, music notes, lecture books, financial records, looking through it and suddenly this music starts playing and there was really no one else around and I never discovered the source of the music. It was just music playing. Uh, it was not the kind of music my grandfather would have played but it wasn't too far off. It, it was wordless music. It had a kind of soft jazz quality. My grandfather was a classical musician, so he would not have played jazz, but it, you know, it's not like it was rock or something. You know, it was, it was a kind of ambient music and I just never figured out where it came from. And it seemed to complement the experience really well. Um, so that was a, that was just an interesting sense of kind of something unexplainable in the world creating this experience for me such that I could really um, remember it, you know? Because I think that kind of, those kinds of experiences, if nothing else, are, are very memorable. On Constant Wonder, we're spending time with writer-cartoonist Amy Kurzweil. She's author and illustrator of two graphic memoirs, Flying Couch and Artificial. They're about her quest to discover her past and maybe in the process come to understand herself better within the fabric of a remarkable family legacy and to understand more of what she calls the creative spirit. We'll return in a moment to our conversation with Amy. I'm Marcus Smith. Of all the tangible stuff that I ever pick up, I'm talking about family artifacts now, it's photos. It's always the photos that really have a, a power to startle me. I, I get the sense that these people, these relatives, really existed 100%. And, and they seem to be looking right at me. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about the kinds of photographs that you might save, especially in decades past when we couldn't save every picture we took, you know, you think about the kinds of things that were saved, there's a certain self-curation happening and a kind of dignity, especially the photographs that I was looking at. So I was looking at high contrast, black and white, dramatic photographs of my grandfather at the piano or conducting or, or posed as if he was conducting. There were these pictures of him in uniform because he ended up serving in the American army as a band conductor and served in that capacity as an artist. So there was this real like dignity to what I was encountering. And then later, I mean, it took several trips to the storage unit to sort of get to the inner workings of him, getting to the core of his emotional life, something that's less polished, that's more raw, 
And that was not what I was encountering at first. Wading through truckloads of old documents for use as Fred bought fodder, the, you know, the stuff that Fred bought needed to chew up in order to spit out answers to questions. Amy came across scattered fragments of private diaries. These diaries were where her grandfather seemed most willing to show his true self. Diaries, journals, as we all know, those are places where you might find vulnerable expression. They're less put on or, or curated, as Amy would say. In these diaries, she found ideas that had weighed heavily on Fred's heart. Family, personal matters, of course. Also concerns about his art, the meaning of art, maybe even art as a path to the meaning of it all. As an artist herself, Amy could relate, in many ways, to these diaries and what Fred was disclosing. Maybe he was becoming demystified for her as she read thoughts such as the following. I'm trying to find a position where I don't feel like a fraud. Or, but since I had no father and a weak mother, I think I'm no good either. Or, if I come home late and she doesn't complain, I feel unloved. If she complains, I want to give up, like a child running away from home. It took patience and a lot of digging for Amy to find these expressions. It was almost like I had to journey to get to that stuff where I was able to find language where he would express his insecurities, his anxieties, his struggles. That was an interesting analogy to getting to know a person, you know, that I started with the kind of superficial, not in a negative way superficial, but just the facade of the person and how they kind of want to curate themselves. And then finally getting to the core of their struggles, going through that journey from surface to inner life. And yes, this is absolutely heartfelt stuff. Historians and biographers rejoice when they find material like these fragments and diaries. He didn't destroy them, so he, I assume, was comfortable with them being found. But they weren't framed in the way like, you know, some of his more official documents or photographs or lectures. They were scattered and loose. There was a lot of room for me to project myself onto that and to sort of feel connected to him. Just lines like, I must love myself before others can love me. Um, this sort of like some kind of pep talking that he would do to himself. He was anxious about his status, which a lot of artists I think go through that, like how am I measuring up to others? I think also as an artist, you have to work so hard to survive, to stay in people's consciousness, to make a living, you know. Seeing that in him was the most meaningful thing for me because I really related to it. Who was Fred Kurzweil really? Who was Lillian Fenster really? Amy can easily tell you who Bubby is and what she's like today because they can visit and talk. Bubby's great. She's 97. She's been in the country for a long time and done okay and had a middle-class life and she's got a house and she's got couches dining room tables and a nice green shag carpet rug, <laughs> you know, like she wants to protect those things. And she is motivated to do that in ways that are very funny. So putting down these brightly colored beach towels that in essence obscure the niceness of the things you have, but of course you're protecting it. I think it slowly started to dawn on me that Bubby's habits were not typical. I mean, of course, everybody's grandparents are quirky, but hers were pretty extreme and I wanted to understand where those habits came from. I knew it had something to do with her experience as a Holocaust survivor, but putting it all together was really, really meaningful and really clarifying. So draw a comparison with me now. Amy cares deeply about who her grandfather Fred once was. She cares deeply about who Bubby is and was. Having escaped from a horrible situation in World War II, Bubby has no tangible record or document, memento, no artifact from that earlier life. In Fred's situation, there remains copious documentation from his life, both before and after immigration, but he's not alive. For Amy, both sides of her family's story are characterized by missing, disorienting gaps. Things just slip away. Given the steady march of time, this war generation is slipping from us right now, too. I think Amy is the type of person who is listening, as it were, for the past to speak. 
With Fred, music recordings of his fingers flying over the piano keyboard, those remain. But since his death in 1970, only figuratively through Fredbot has Fred ever spoken. And that comes in reconfigured letters, words, and paragraphs on a computer screen, but never making a peep. I think there's still a central mystery to me about Fred that won't ever completely close. I just had an experience recently where I was presenting from my book at uh, my former grad school in New York, and my dad's cousin was there. This man's father was Fred's brother. He's a bit older than my father, and he remembered Fred. And I was giving this presentation about the book, saying you know some of the things that I've said here, um, reading from the book. And then the last question, you know, my, my father's cousin raises his hand and he's like, I just have to share this story. So it's like, this is not a question, it's a comment, which, you know, you're always a little nervous when that happens. But he started telling the story about how he remembers these holiday experiences with Fred and the family and how everyone would get together and play the piano and Fred would be the last one to play the piano. And when it was his turn, you know, everyone's listening attentively And what my father's cousin remembered is that Fred made this sound when he played the piano. He just started humming. Like he was so into what he was doing. It was so sort of intensely absorbed that his his body would vibrate and this like sound would come out of him. And that really struck um, my father's cousin. And he just told that story to everyone. It was the first time I'd heard it. And I was just like, wow, I'm still having experiences where I'm just like shocked by something. For, and for some reason that, that shocked me because I've never heard my grandfather's voice. I don't know what his voice sounds like. And to be reminded of the fact that he like had like a vibration that I just, I can't access, that I'll never be able to access. It just felt like that the humming was like such a perfect example of something that I will never be able to experience. Hearing about it was meaningful, but it's like, oh, I'm never going to hear it. Maybe the project has been a kind of like coming to terms with what's actually lost. You know, there are things that aren't lost, but there are some things that are. And like that humming sound, you know, is lost. I think the question of what that is and where it's gone is the is the sort of universal spiritual question. I think I go to bed at night sometimes asking, where does somebody's creative energy go? I don't have the answer to that question, but that is that is a question I spend a lot of time thinking about. Yeah. You like the question. I like the question. Yeah, I like the question. Amy's two graphic memoirs are ambitious, more than straightforward detective or genealogical projects. As I poured over page after compelling page, I noticed this. Here is someone telling her own story about coming of age and awakening to the world with self-awareness and a love for creative engagement with the sweeping backdrop of family lore, the Judaic tradition, the Holocaust, immigration, the power of music, and whatever it is we experience as the creative spirit. These memoirs have hinged on a labor of love made possible by persistent focus, attentiveness, patient reflection. And even though we're not all good at drawing pictures, who can't relate to an artist trying to capture what is fleeting to make abstract memories concrete? To conclude our visit with her today, let's get from her now a sense of what it feels like to imagine onto paper so many important events and cherished lives. How can I use drawing to create artifacts that aren't there. You know, how can I document people in my own way through imagination? Amy was in Vienna seeking whatever vibrations might still linger there from Fred's early life. Picture with me how she proceeded to find this grandfather no longer living there, or at least find something essential or meaningful about him by taking a day to visit an apartment building where he once lived, if only to draw its exterior door. That's it. Just a doorway at street level. 
Here's how this unfolds when you're earnest about your venture and hoping for some sort of inspiration at a spot where you know your father's father once stood. You're kind of physically uncomfortable because you're in a place where you're not comfortable drawing. It's very intense. Your focus is really strained. You're trying to shut out a lot. There's cars passing. There's People are watching you. You know, when I draw in public, I always feel self-conscious about the fact that people are watching me. And often people will come up to me and be like, what are you drawing? And that like, yeah, you're like, I don't want, <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Um, so it's like, you're really working hard to shut the thing out. And like, it's almost like you have to be looking through a telescope in order to just let the connection of your pen or pencil to the object, just be the only thing in your consciousness. And that, and it is a strain. The next phase, like later when you leave the location and then you go somewhere quiet, your studio or your desk or just a, a park or something. I think in this case, I did leave and go to a park and, and continue the drawing. I was had more sort of peace and I could sit down and be comfortable. Then you have like your memory of standing in front of the thing that you were drawing and you're like revisiting the memory. And a lot of times that's actually when the questions come to you. So the, the drawing is like actually a kind of a, it's a mnemonic, you know, it helps you connect to the initial place that you were when you started the drawing. And I think that those moments of peace and quiet when you're with your memories are actually where the most sort of interesting experiences of attention happen. Because what you're attending to are your memories and the questions that your memories bring up. The sort of focused attention I gave to recreating his artifacts and, and putting that into my book. A lot of that was in the service of trying to connect to people who are around. Deepening my connection to the people in the way that works of art are often about one thing, but really are about these sort of universal relationships and universal themes. Focusing on Fred was, I think, a way of focusing on other characters in my life, like my partner and my father. And, you know, with the chatbot project, my father and I had something that we could focus on together, communicating in real time. So I think that connection to the past sort of like, like loops back around into the present. And I can say with certainty that that has come to be true. I feel a lot closer to my father because of projects that we work on together. And this is, you know, this is one of them, but it's a pretty big one. It's been really successful in that sense. Thanks to Amy for the time that she has spent with us. Amy Kurzweil is a professional cartoonist. Her work appears regularly in The New Yorker, and she's writer and artist for two graphic memoirs, Flying Couch and the second titled Artificial, A Love Story. This episode of the Constant Wonder podcast was produced with assistance from Lydia McElroy, Tenery Taylor, and Eric Schultzka. Sound design was by James Call. I'm Marcus Smith. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio.